Welcome back to another Q&A. If you have any questions, please post them down below. But before we get started, I have a special announcement to make. The channel is now officially sponsored by Barbell Apparel, a premium clothing brand that specializes in athletic apparel for serious lifters or muscular builds. Designed to be comfortable, stylish, and versatile, it's what I've been wearing all my recent videos and will continue doing so as the quality is off the charts. In fact, it's the first time I've been able to find off-the-rack clothing that fits flawlessly on my frame without needing to be tailored. The athletic cuts are both tight and loose in all the right spots, with form-fitting sleeves that accentuate your arms and V-taper. Same for lower body. You're never constricted and can actually sprint, jump, and do heavy squats while wearing jeans, chinos, and even dress pants. The clothing is versatile enough to dress up and down, always looking and feeling good in and out of the gym. Barbell Apparel's commitment to quality and performance is truly outstanding. From soft, moisture wicking fabrics to odor resistant technology the innovative features make for a stylish yet functional combination guys you've never worn anything like this whether you're lounging around or training hard there's nothing you can't do with barbell apparel so i'm truly honored to represent a brand that is dedicated to us and if you want to wear the exact outfit shown in my training videos and informative segments check out the link in the description box you can see my entire collection, so try whatever you think looks amazing. With almost 7,000 five-star reviews, I'm confident you'll be shocked at the overall quality, just like I was. It's the real deal. So expect to get frequent updates from me regarding new drops, restocks, and discounts. Again, big thanks to Barbell Apparel for choosing me. I love what the brand represents. Now, let's dive into the Q&A. Hey Alex, I am 15 and a novice lifter. I know that I can make linear progression for one to two years and then I will become intermediate. Will I be able to progress easier than intermediate adult lifters because of my body's natural development at age 17 to 18? Love your channel, thanks for your information. I wouldn't say so. There isn't a big difference between 17 to 18 and 21 to 25. And even if there is a minor recovery advantage, that's negated by the fact that you lack experience and ego can be a big problem. Like let me say this, my natural recovery on absolute level was better at that age but if I compare it to now, being an elite lifter was older and stronger, it was infinitely worse. Why? Because I didn't know how to train. I made so many errors that left me feeling beat up, like picking the wrong movements, overdoing the volume, not properly periodizing, not managing overuse, and lifting with undesirable form. So in reality, many young adults have issues due to lifestyle changes. Usually out of school, living alone, working a full-time job, and having many more life responsibilities. Whereas, when you're a high school student, you don't have much to worry about. You're well-fed and have complete scheduling flexibility. Sure, you may have to study, but that's often without a job, or at most being part-time. There's way less stress. You can train as much as you want. Every day is hyper-optimized for recovery. It's almost like your fitness influencer. So I can't blame your hormones for superior recovery, but if it is hypothetically true, I still see that it gets canceled out because you don't know your body yet. Unless coached by a professional or running a proven program right off the bat, making mistakes is inevitable. That said, you are watching my channel, and in the past, I wish there were natties that gave this kind of advice, as many plateaus could have been avoided. The fitness world has truly evolved, and that definitely gives you more leeway. So if you manage to learn from all our pitfalls and do mostly everything right, yes, you will have superhuman recovery, but still, there's that teenager inside you that might come out at times. And although you're likely mature and ahead of your peers of this generation, your brain is still not fully developed until 25 years old. So there are situations where you're not making the right training decisions. And if I look back at my journey, I can confirm that that's the truth. So as a result, I can't promise insane recovery. If it is, it's small. So my advice to you is to constantly seek new information, aim for higher standards, prioritize your health, and rest like a king. Don't sacrifice that because you think you're some young, hormonally optimized workhorse. Try to maximize all the factors that lead to success. Keep your head up high. Follow the best natties. And by the time you're even 21, you have a better physique than 99% of adults. Hey Alex, after five years of dedicated training, my long-term goal is to reach elite levels of strength and hypertrophy as a natural, but my workouts are taking at least two hours. I'm training upper lower split four days a week. All my workouts are two exercises that tag in the supersets. Is there any way to make my workouts shorter and not sacrifice the results? The thing is, 
upper lower is naturally going to be longer because you're doing everything. Sometimes my workouts are 90 to 120 minutes. It is what it is. Even with antagonist supersets, keep in mind they're in the gym four days a week with twice a week muscle protein synthesis and everything is efficiently stressed. That said, you probably are resting way too much between sets, which is actually optimal for hypertrophy, but when doing supersets, you can probably cut it back by a minute just because of the time it takes to go from one exercise to the next. It adds up. So if you're resting five minutes, maybe it's six in total. Therefore, I'd recommend resting two to two and a half minutes on paper, which would then round up to three-ish. Then for isolation work, you can incorporate giant sets for more than two exercises. So if you're doing curls and pushdowns, why not add in face pulls as a third motion? It's not going to affect anything and you don't need to do that on its own. Same for leg extensions and leg curls with abs. Now another secret is the amount of sets you're doing per exercise. Are you doing three to five sets? Why not drop it down to two? This is how I've been training throughout this entire cut and you know what? I love it so much that when I'm bulking again, I'm gonna keep it up. The idea of three sets of 10 for everything is so arbitrary, obviously time proven and godly, but maybe you don't need that much volume. Maybe you've been leaving so many reps in reserve that that's why you require so many sets. But if you go to failure, where at least stick to the zero to two RAR zone, you can get away with far less. Therefore, I'd recommend antagonist supersets with shorter rest, plus giant sets for your accessories and a higher RB with a lower volume approach, which will significantly shorten your workouts. As a true natural, can you let us know what strength levels to expect when cutting down to 12% body fat? Curious to know where your lifts were at per 15 pound increments since bear mode. Thanks again for all your help. 12% body fat is a good weight at which you'll still be very strong, but when you try to reach single digit, your numbers will plummet to the depths of hell. To the point where I'm so embarrassed that I won't even share my numbers. Everything has become significantly weaker. I am weaker now than I was some years ago on some compounds, but not all. It depends where you lose muscle. For example, my back is essentially the same and I have been lifting the same total loads for months, even though I've lost an incredible amount of weight. But pushing always takes a disgusting hit. And that's realistically what most lifters can expect. I'm sorry if I'm demotivating you, but this is the truth. Your leverages get modified, and there's a reason why the best benches in the world are super heavyweights. Even with elite naturals like Freaky D, who was pressing 550 without issues, cannot do it now in a lean state. He can still bench over four plates, but not five. Therefore, you can still be an elite lifter on the way down. But there's levels to this. So the best case scenario, if you bench 405 at bear mode, is retaining 350. And if you were at three plates, you might get down to 250 to 275. So you're still strong, the bulk was worth it. And whatever you were lifting before that body fat, you won't go below that amount unless you messed up your diet and programming. Nevertheless, you will not keep everything as you cut. And one more thing, even though you lose strength in a deficit, when it is time to maintain that body fat or rebound ever so slightly, most of the strength you had when bulked will return. Although you were weaker in a prolonged calorie deficit, the moment you start living like a normal human being, strength will explode. So the good news in all this is that what you're experiencing now is purely temporary. So do not be afraid to shred. Besides, you have to do it anyway one day for your health. The more you bulk, the fatter you will get and the more you'll suffer in the end. So do not become a perma bulker who calls himself bear mode but has 30% body fat. You don't want to be that guy because a strength drop off will be even worse than if you kept yourself accountable with a reasonable body fat range. And so I recommend bulking and cutting within the 12 to 20% range or even 12 to 15 if you want to minimize fat gain. And moving forward, I am only going to stick to a 15 pound weight gain for my box. I am not doing 20 plus anymore. Not a question, but if the standard size of handles for gym equipment was just slightly larger, people wouldn't have such weak wrists and forearms. It might slow down your progression slightly, but it's worth it in my opinion. Yeah, I 100% agree. And honestly, guys, this is one of the secrets behind my forearm development. 
they are overdeveloped. And I think it's because of my hands. They're not that big. I have stubby, shorter fingers. So every time I grab onto even regular handles, it's similar to that grip. I can't get a full proper squeeze in. So my forms are working overtime on everything. As a result, my grip had to evolve. And now it's never a limiting factor. So I technically don't need straps, though I still use them for some movements like heavy RDLs because there is no point in using a mixed grip if you're not a competitive power lifter. But just to say, I've never had to strap up on pull-ups and my best is four plates. I also hang for well over three minutes. I'd win those freaking challenges a lot and do 500 plus pull-ups in a session without my forearms tiring out. You've seen this. They have developed extreme fatigue resistance and strength such that they're okay with almost anything minus claw type strength where I'm grabbing with the tips of my fingers. So I know that fat bar pull-ups, fat bar rows, and fat bar curls are legit. Anytime you can make an implement thicker, not only does it help with golfer's elbow and shoulder pain during presses, it also has the secondary benefit of growing your forms through intense isometric contractions. And yes, that makes a difference over many years. The workload adds up. And at this point, I don't even do wrist curls anymore or train like an arm wrestler. Prioritizing thicker implements is the secret in direct growth. For example, if you check out these Pepe dumbbells, this is the normal grip where I have to clench pretty hard. And here's the fat addition. Notice how my fingers don't even overlap. That's what you want for gorilla forearms. Provided it doesn't affect the weight too much, it's worth experimenting with. Yo, Alice, I tried rack pulls today in the middle of a hypertrophy cycle, so I don't care much about strength, just getting huge, and got four or five times one. It isn't much, but I felt like a total boss and my upper back is wrecked. I dropped down to 315 for 3x5 with two second holds at the top. Thanks for teaching me this awesome movement. I love it. I'm glad that you're benefiting from rack pulls, and I like that you did three sets of five with two second holds. That'll do wonders for your traps. However, you should stop with the wonder maxes if you only care about hypertrophy. Forget about partial rep singles, just do the three plates. You're going to get more effective reps in with a better stimulus to ratio. Also, if that is your number, I sure hope it's below the knee. If it's above the knee, yet three plates is tough, then you have no business doing rack pulls. They are not for novices, meaning regular hip hinges will provide all the weight stretching benefits you need. Partials are not the answer right now, as there are no limiting factors. Your spinal rectors are not a weak link, and you more work for those glutes and hamstrings. So if you're one of those guys who has a weaker below the knee rack pull than you pull off the floor, it's possible that you can't even do 300 on a conventional deadlift. And if that's you, then you're wasting your time doing rack pulls, even though you're feeling your upper back like crazy. So that's my honest advice. You must earn your right to old. Why would you want to go heavy when it's not advantageous? Do so when the time is right. You mentioned 300 pound pull-ups as a good strength standard. What are some good strength goals for other weighted calisthenics movements? Love that you emphasize these movements. Well, we know that a 300 pound pull-up is relatively vast for most people. And given that divs are typically stronger than pull-ups, pressing standards must by default be higher. In my experience, the difference in weight is about 50 to 100 pounds. So that's what you should aim for. Like I can perform a weighted dip with over 400 pounds, whereas my pull-up is 350-ish. And the stronger you are, the more the gap between the two movements closes but it still won't be one-to-one. -one. It's very rare to find someone who can do five plates on both pull-ups and dips, as one is essentially world-class, while the other is something that many street lifters are now hitting on the regular. As for weighted push-ups, whatever you can do for an AMRAP of 10 should be almost the same as your one or max pull-up. So the best I've done is 160 on the deficit push-up for sets of 10, so it's pretty spot on. That said, Non-weighted calisthenics has many more standards, such as handstand push-ups. If you can do three sets of 10 to 15 reps, that is an incredible achievement. You don't even need to wear weight vests, and I certainly don't, even though I can. not So, what other calisthenics moves do you want to know about? With specifics, I can give you a lot more standards. How would someone who can only get seven pull-ups structure their pull-up routine for bad gains? And how would you progressively overload it over time? Honestly, if you can do seven pull-ups in one set, then you can hit five in the second set, which is optimal for hypertrophy, as you are getting all the effective reps in. Then, 
if you want to do one more set as a back down and can't hit five, use reverse bands. So if you just do that, double progression will naturally occur. Nothing is complicated. So work up to two sets of seven, where the first set would easily have some reps in the tank, and then switch your rep range to eight to 10. After you can get 10, 10, you can now start microloading, which I know may seem early to start, but if you use a two and a half to five pound plate, you'll be back to your original starting reps and can restart the same process. People think that pull-ups require special programming, but that's only true when you're trying to learn it for the first time or overcome serious plateaus, not when building base novice level strength. In addition, you can also do grease in the groove on the side. These are high frequency pull-ups and the standard for this is simply being able to do one. So anyone who could do one pull-up can repeat it multiple times throughout the day. It's that simple. So if you do this consistently over several weeks and months, you will become a pull-up beast. And in your case, since you can do seven pull-ups, I try hitting three every couple of hours or every hour, whatever works for you. There's no exact time. Just dial in that movement pattern and you'll quickly become efficient. Next thing you know, you can easily rep out 15 to 20 pull-ups and that's when the real fun begins. What's good, Alex? Do you still do tons of cardio? And if so, how do you do it currently in your schedule? Thank you. During a bulking or maintenance phase, I actually do more cardio than when I'm cutting. Why? Because I have more energy and diet is number one. In fact, getting down to maybe 10% body fat or so has been easier just by substituting certain foods, being disciplined with tracking my calories, weighing everything, and not giving in to cravings. This is actually the least amount of cardio I've done in a long time. Yet, my diet is going smoother than ever. I consume a couple hundred calories less, big deal. The scale is dropping every week. That said, I do recommend cardio for everyone and will go hard again relatively soon, especially as I try to get down to six or 7% body fat. But I'm just saying that to get to this level, it hasn't been that important. So from 200 pounds to 181, I didn't do much cardio. And then from 181 to say 165, I was doing burpee routines for 20 to 45 minutes tops, 300 being the max in the session. Didn't even try 500 or getting close to Iron Wolf's level of conditioning. Just a little goes a long way and you probably don't need as much cardio as you think. For example, in 2019, I was running every day for six months straight, at least five kilometers. Yet, I was only in the 160s. Now, I'm far below that while doing less work. So many times, your body gets fitter, you adapt, and your hunger increases. So the way I look at cardio is that yes, if you do it the proper way, it will assist your fat loss journey, but that's not why I value it. For me, it's about health and work capacity benefits. I simply feel better when I do cardio and can therefore push myself more, especially when it comes to leg days. So as difficult as a high volume squat session is, a burpee circuit style workout is even more difficult. I know that sounds extreme, but if you try out some of the basic routines that don't require equipment, you'll quickly learn why those who excel at cardio can push it to the limit with their weight training. Just look at Jeffrey Verity Schofield. He had a marathon running background. Do you think that doesn't play a role when he's training to the max? Those faces are no coincidence and developing pain tolerance can come from other sports. Hey Alex, are strength adaptations from a peaking program going to last or are they going to vanish as soon as I stop training with heavier weights? Thank you. By design, you're going to lose the adaptations as the name implies. You perform at your best on that day and then a couple weeks later, a drop off occurs due to fatigue accumulation and lower specificity. It is what it is. If powerlifters could somehow maintain this peak strength at all times, they would do so. But we don't see this. The only exception is if you never actually peaked and your general strength is just so high that you're constantly raising all performance attributes. But that means you're not the best of what you're capable of. So the only chance you have of best retaining your adaptations is if you're running the conjugate system. If you don't fall back into doing max effort work, which is close enough to your competition maxes, you're still gonna be at 90%. So at least hit some heavy singles. Otherwise, you're gonna get weaker. And if you're on a bodybuilding program or even hypertrophy block, you might have been able to do 500 pounds for the squat on week one. And by week four, you literally get stapled. Four and a half plates is hard. Probably still possible, but the RPE feels comparable to when you were peaked. Is it because you lost muscle in your legs? 
Not at all. And anyone who runs a hypertrophy block will tell you that they always come out stronger afterwards. And it's the same for bodybuilding competitions, which is not even a strength sport. You look your best on show day, after which a day or two later, you start to spill over and look blurrier. It's not that everyone fell off the diet. Sure, that is a big factor. You want to eat, but let's say you do have a competition a couple weeks out and you have to maintain that condition. You still don't look your best after show day. Everything is manipulated for a specific time frame with super compensation. Everything could be high, but it won't be the highest. Otherwise, it would defeat the purpose of a peak. So sometimes you hyper specialize and other stuff takes a hit. So if you're going to go back to generalized training, well, you can't expect to maintain something that was not generalized. Hey, Alex, do you think it's worth programming dumbbell pullovers as a novice? I heard that it increases your ribcage size. I do believe in the concept of ribcage expansion and pullovers combined with breathing squats might be the best way to achieve it. Some guys even suggest that this would be helpful for those who experience sternum pain from dips. Also, why not start working on ribcage expansion early on in your lifting journey to avoid backtracking? That's what I did as one of my mentors, Leroy Colbert, always talked about the benefits of dumbbell pullovers. So during puberty, I did pullovers on the regular and I happened to have a large ribcage on a relatively small freight. Is this due to genetics or training? I can't say for certain, but others like natural hypertrophy and golden era bookworm have also reported the same phenomenon and are currently big advocates for pullovers, claiming that it completely transformed their physiques. And seeing how all the old school grades swore by this exercise, I'm inclined to believe that this idea is true. In fact, bodybuilders from the silver era are noticeably larger here than those from the bronze era, or even some enhanced bodybuilders of today. That's likely because the pullover was an S tier, highly prioritized lift, even executed in strength competitions. So starting with pullovers early might be worth it in the long term. And if it's not due to ribcage expansion, you're at least developing the serratus, lats, chest, long head of the triceps, and ability to hit vacuums. So I think there's something to pullovers, and I'll be hitting them hard once more. Hey man, big fan, you are the best. You still recommend dead benching? Of course. If you want to maximize your one or max, this is a good way to do it. It's comparable to a deadlift in terms of power development off the floor, but now you're building explosiveness off your chest. It also helps build resilient pecs. So the only problem is that it can be very hard on recovery. So if you're going to incorporate this into your routine, you can't rotate it in too frequently. Don't do close grip dead bench in week one, Swiss bar dead bench in week two, and dead bench with chains in week three. Before you know it, you'll start having kinks in your shoulders, or your pecs will be so sore that you won't be able to handle much work. I learned that the hard way. It's not an abusable variation, and also higher reps are not advised. So don't be doing a lot of pin presses for sets of five to ten because it's metal on metal crashing combined with you pressing from the worst possible position. So do be careful with volume. What you feel on that first set will be multiplied. The only exception is if you're doing strap presses. So you need a rack that has that option, like my hydro rack. This way, the bar sinks into a nice soft touch. Otherwise, if you weren't truly doing full ROM on dead benching, you're only a couple inches above your chest. You're just doing it to break up the eccentric concentric chain without having to pause and hold, then you can always do floor presses at that same angle. Try to match that position or do a board press using a half board to one board. This way you standardize the wrong in a dead stop way, but it won't beat up your recovery. So always look at the contact point as that's what determines how messed up you'll feel after. Hi Alex, do you still have the same opinion on connective tissue work with bands and overspeed eccentrics? Absolutely. This is one of my known secrets to having bulletproof elbows, even with hypermobility. I still do my band pushdowns and band curls, like everything I showed in my elbow pain solution video. All applies, even though it came out years ago. That said, the information is gold, but I do plan on remaking that video just to show more exercises and the quality is not up to my current standards. So the only thing that's dated 
is the filming experience, but the advice which was inspired by Louis Simmons, Dr. Mel Sif, and John Quint is still relevant. Always will be. The fast reps not only increase blood flow, but also thicken the connective tissue. Like how come I haven't had any elbow injuries despite being the perfect candidate for it? This is one of the main reasons alongside programming that features higher exercise selection. But the bands, unmatched for injury prevention. And these days, I do dual banded pushdowns with overspeed eccentrics. That way, if there's potential long head overuse from pull-ups or extensions, I can reduce that as well. So now there's even more benefits. Anything that is properly lined up, mixed in with the overspeed eccentrics, is optimal for pain-free results. And no, you cannot replicate this with cables. So yes, get some bands, do your pushdowns, you won't regret it. Alex, I got a stretch mark next to my left biceps. Very disappointing thing. Fortunately, it's small, one line. Will moisturizing do some good? Why would any serious lifter want to moisturize their stretch marks? These are the ultimate signs that you're gaining muscle. Like last year, I got two new ones and was ecstatic. I even told my lifting buddies, yo, check out these stretch marks. You should be proud. They're actually making gains, man. Like, What's happening is that the bicep is increasing in size and therefore the skin is being stretched out to accommodate. Who wouldn't want that? So no, I'm not going to give you any advice except to wear them with honor. These are your battle scars from being in the gym and putting in honest work. The more, the better. So if you look like a stretch mark freak where they're just everywhere, you should keep your head up high. Always. Being disappointed is beyond my comprehension because every time I get stretch marks, I'm always insanely happy. Not once have I been like, oh no, it's gonna ruin my physique. Come on. Also, those oils that you might have bought don't work. Pregnant women would know. So just live with them and continue accumulating stretch marks. Or worst case, you get tattooed. It's not a big deal though. I got some on my quads, a little bit on the outer pec, and now biceps. Stretch marks for the win. Okay, final question. Alex, on the topic of good morning carryover to the deadlift, what is your experience with the SSB? I'm currently doing the upside down version on a three week wave and I'm only hitting 135, 95 respectively. Cheers, brother, good luck on your cut. Thank you, man, and don't be alarmed that you're only lifting 135. I was doing that not too long ago as well. It's a harder variation after all. For example, when I was doing 275 on the low bar good mornings, I never even got close to that with the SSB. And in reverse, the max I was doing was 205, which equated to elite deadlifting numbers. So on average, if I'm doing the regular style, it'll be around two blades. And even now, 185 is a great weight for volume work. If I just do full range of motion, bend all the way down and control it, I can build most of the muscle that I need in the posterior chain. So 185, 135. It's not a massive difference, right? As long as you're using correct form, that's what matters. And the carryover is super high. So what I love about the SSB is that the bar stays in a consistent position. You don't have to stay so tight such that the bar will roll up and down your traps. It's already set. So the only con, if you want to call it one, is that it works your neck extensors more. So you might get some little exertion headaches after some sets because you have to extend against those pads. But who doesn't want to get more yoked? And I'll take a consistent movement pattern all day, every day. Plus, this is easier on the shoulder joints. It's called the safety squat bar for a reason. And when designed correctly, like the SS3 by Bells of Steel, you have a king good morning variation. By far, my favorite. And I would even say you can use it exclusively. So... You're lifting less weight, it's easy on the joints in some respects, and has tremendous carryover to all hip hinges. What's there not to love? If you weren't a fan of straight bar good mornings, swish the SSB, and you might not want to go back. And with that said, we are done with this Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it. Now it's time for you to ask some more questions. Let's see them down below, and I'll talk to you all in the next video.